Um, good morning, everyone. And just a quick reminder, um, particularly if you're calling in via regular phone, please make sure that you are muted if you are not speaking. Um, let's get started today. Uh, my name is Laura Meisner, and I'm a contractor with USAID's Office of UN U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance. Um, for those of you who are saying that there's background music, please note that that's your computer. You can look in the upper right corner of the screen, and where it says play music to test audio, you can just hit the pause button, um, and then that should hopefully fix the problem. Um, if you're still having issues, of course, as always, please um, make a comment in the chat box to everyone, and we will try and fix that for you. Um, as I said, I'm at USAID's Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance, OFTA. Um, I'm the Economic Recovery and Markets Advisor there, and I work on local markets, helping vulnerable populations get back to uh, restoring their livelihoods or beginning new ones, and I also work on cash and voucher interventions. Um, we have three terrific speakers today, all uh, working with Mercy Corps. Um, we'll have Alex Humphrey, who is the lead author of the Currency of Connections report, which we'll be delving into today. Um, he manages field research programming for South Sudan, and up until very recently was based there in South Sudan. Um, and prior to that, he was with the Open Society Foundation. We also have Jiang Kim with Mercy Corps, who is the senior researcher for resilience. She works on topics related to resilience, such as women's empowerment, migration, social connections, and food security. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, we have Ivy Krishnan, or Vi. Uh, she is currently a researcher working on Mercy Corps' markets and crises and cash programming, particularly in the Middle East and in Syria. She's a co-author of the Currency of Connections report and also a Wages of War report in Syria. Um, Assuming that everybody can still hear very well, I think I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues with Mercy Corps, and they are going to delve right into this research and how it matters for practitioners. Um, this research was supported by OFTA, and we're particularly excited about it for a number of reasons, particularly because I think um, it really uh, challenges and gives a lot of nuance and meaning to how vulnerable people managed to survive and thrive in times of crises and has really useful implications for how we might want to think through response and recovery programming, um, particularly in terms of targeting or understanding the sharing economy, um, as well as thinking about maybe how we redefine vulnerability and the kinds of assets that people have access to because thinking of things in a pure sort of household economic unit model, um, as you'll see, doesn't necessarily make full sense, and really people do use all types of communities. Um, so I think it's really helpful to learn how those communities and connections are affected by crises and how they persist through them. Um, so I will stop with the spoilers and turn it over to my colleagues now. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. Can I just do a quick sound check? Is everybody hearing me? Yes. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. So thank you, Laura. Uh, my name is Alex Humphrey. I work with Mercy Corps. Um, and I was um, involved in writing the Currency of Connections report, as Laura mentioned. And we're just so happy to have all of you here today. Thanks for your interest and for the, the great turnout. And thanks to Laura and Market Links for giving us this platform and, of course, to Opta as well for making this research possible. Um, so as Laura mentioned, for the last year or so, Mercy Corps and the Feinstein International Center at Tufts University have been implementing a research program in South Sudan in hopes of better understanding some of the ways in which households are socially connected to each other um, and also how they rely on those social connections for support um, during difficult times or during crises. So um, before we kind of dive into to some of the things that we're learning and some of the implications that, that our research has for, for all of you, we think, um, I wanted to give you a, a, a bit of background on what the existing research on this topic says and, and kind of why we um, wanted to, 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 to pursue this, this line of, um, of research in South Sudan. Um, one of the most important things that the literature on this topic says is that a social connectedness lens or a view of resilience through uh, social connectedness is really appropriate and applicable in lots of different contexts. So it's relevant in emergency contexts, it's relevant during early response, it's relevant in development contexts, 
And in South Sudan, as we learned, it's certainly relevant in context of conflict as well. So um, one of the interesting pieces of research that um, kind of inspired us to, to, to do this work uh, was conducted by our colleagues at Feinstein International Center, which involved Gian at that time, who's one of my co-presenters. Uh, she's now with Mercy Corps. Um, but that re research looked at the role that social connections play in households' resilience um, during famine in Somalia. And the study kind of showed that when aid actors fail to understand how households are socially connected to each other and how they cope um, on their own terms during crisis, um, aid can risk inadvertently undermining the local support systems that households rely on. And, um, and those support systems are very often based on the, the social relationships or connections that people have with one another. And another really interesting thing that that study showed is that during crises, social connections change. They evolve. Um, and as that um, crisis worsened in Somalia, as the famine got worse, the types of social connections that people relied on change and the nature of those connections changed as well. So the lesson there for us is that social connections are dynamic. They change in the course of a crisis. And we certainly are seeing that in South Sudan too, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, briefly, in Ethiopia, Mercy Corps also found that during drought, um, households commonly relied on their extended social networks um, to access really important resources, especially with regards to their livelihoods, continuing um, or adapting their livelihoods. And in Nepal, following the 2015 earthquake there, as well as in Philippines, um, after the typhoon Haiyan, uh, Mercy Corps found that households with certain types of social connections tended to do better in terms of food security. Um, and they were also more often able to find kind of quality housing or shelter uh, more quickly after the, um, the, the earthquake, uh, for example. Um, so, so those are some of the, the reasons that we wanted to look at this. That's why we think it's important. And our research has confirmed, um, con confirmed our hypothesis, and we'll get into to a little bit um, uh, more specifics later. But uh, before we move on, um, I just wanted to make one quick note about terminology. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the term social capital. Um, and indeed, much of the literature that I just referenced uses the term social capital. Uh, but you might notice that instead I'm using the term social connectedness. Um, and that's because we want to adopt kind of a more holistic perspective of this concept with this research. And we want to acknowledge that connectedness is not necessarily a positive thing, um, like the term social capital often implies. Um, so, you know, for example, sometimes um, social connectedness for certain people may actually mean marginalization or exclusion for other groups. Um, so we want to use the term social connectedness in our research in hopes of adding a little bit more nuance to this conversation. Um, but for the most part, um, when we say social connectedness, we're most likely referring to what you understand as, as social capital. Um, so before we kind of go any further, I wanted to give you a few more specifics about the, the nature of our work in South Sudan. Um, so in South Sudan, we want to build on that existing evidence base that I described. Um, and while most of the research uh, that's been done in this field has been retrospective in nature, meaning that it's conducted after a crisis has ended, looking back, um, we're measuring and researching social connectedness in the context of an ongoing humanitarian emergency in South Sudan. And that's important because it allows us to look at things like what happens before aid reaches a community, and how, does, uh, how do these dynamics of social connectedness change during a crisis and after aid has been, has been uh, provided? Um, so in South Sudan, um, we're conducting research in a few different um, program sites. Uh, the first is in Paninjar County, which is located in southern Unity State, which is right in the middle of the, the country. Um, Paninjar County is an opposition-controlled area. Um, it's very rural. Um, and it was protected from the worst of the fighting uh, during the war because of the, its geography. Um, and as a result, many IDPs fled to that area um, during the crisis, and they remain there um, today. Uh, many of them do. Um, the second program site, um, research site rather, um, is the Bentu Protection of Civilian Site, or POC, um, which is located in Rubcona County at the far northern um, tip of the country. Um, and the Bentu POC is effectively an enormous IDP camp, um, which houses over 100,000 civilians still, um, within the confines of a, a peacekeep, UN peacekeeping 
uh, base that uh, was present there before the, the current um, war. Um, and finally, we also conducted research in the communities which are immediately adjacent or outside um, the, the Bentu POC. Um, and that's an interesting context because it's home to many returnees or people who have left that community and now are coming back, um, either from the POC or from elsewhere in South Sudan. Um, and each of these different program sites are unique, uh, and we selected them because we want to understand how does social connectedness differ in different displacement contexts. So um, through this research, we talk to IDPs, to hosts, and returnees, um, and, and we're trying to understand more about how do social connections, how do social connections differ within these different populations, and why are they important um, for these communities, often in different ways. Um, so really briefly, I'll tell you a little bit about the methodology that we use, and then we'll get on to the, the more exciting stuff. Uh, so this research was both qualitative and quantitative. Um, so on the qualitative side, we conducted extensive key informant and household interviews, as well as focus group discussions in all of those research sites. And really importantly, we talked to as many people as possible, men and women of lots of different ages, of different livelihoods, of different socioeconomic statuses. And we did that because we really want to understand how social connectedness is important um, in different ways for different people. We wanted to talk to a cross-section of the community to get a really holistic perspective about the lived experiences um, of the people in these communities. And, and that's really important, especially for the quantitative aspect of our research, because we want to ground all of our research instruments in these lived experiences that people um, have uh, in, in all of our different research communities. So I won't tell you um, any more about the quantitative methodology. I'll leave that for Gian uh, later in this presentation. Um, but with that introduction, um, I want to turn it over to Vi now, um, and she will be able to give you a, a better overview of some of the specific ways in which social connectedness uh, is linked to resilience in South Sudan. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I have the pleasure of presenting the most, the more exciting part that Alex was talking about. So just wanted to say, normally we'd make you wait until the very end of the presentation to talk about key takeaways, but we thought we'd switch it around. So for every section, you will see a picture like this and a key takeaway so that when we're talking through what we found, it will help you better situate how that information relates to this takeaway. But the other thing I would like to urge all of you to do is think about the ways in which social connections matter in your own personal life. In the last month, did you reach out to a friend or a family or someone on Facebook to ask for information or support? and think about how important these are in our own lives. And then think about, uh, for us that have multiple resources, if these connections are so important, how important they are for people in the context where we work that have fewer resources. There are multiple ways in which households in South Sudan are connected. We wanted to talk about only two of these types. One is the way in which individuals and households are connected to one another. The main types of these connections, one is kin, so relatives, people who are related to you by blood or marriage, and then the other category being non-kin, so friends, neighbors, acquaintances, etc. So while friends and neighbors and acquaintances are also important in the South Sudan context because they're people that might live right next door, so if you have a short-term need, you could go to them for support. Kinship connections in South Sudan play a particularly important role because the, your kin support is obligatory, right? So individual and household level connections, they are governed and regulated by informal rules around sharing and support, but kin support is obligatory. So while friends and neighbors might support you when you have a need, kin, kin cannot refuse no matter how severe the crisis. Given how important these connections are, the South Sudanese use various strategies, they share various types of resources as a way of maintaining these relationships. And these relationships are reciprocal in nature. So if I help you, you help me, um, sort of system, right? Um, the people do share a small amount of cash. They often share labor, for example, clearing um, farmland or harvesting crops, etc. But food and cows play quite a central role in the life of South Sudanese. 
So during our research, we heard a lot of respondents talk about, um, you know, most of their quotations in quotes included something around food. So they would say something like, um, it, uh, you know, we, we share our resources, we don't eat alone. Or if someone was trying to describe the individuals or the people that are in his family or her family, they would say, these are people that share my cooking pot. And I noticed that some of you said you're going to South Sudan. This is, you know, you will find interestingly in some of the assessments in South Sudan, uh, a definition of a household is people that share the same cooking pot. So it's just an interesting side note for those of you who are up in South Sudan or headed to South Sudan. Um, besides that, I wanted to talk about this sort of marriage, right? And this is where cattle plays an important role. Marriage is a crucial way of diversifying one's social network. It's a way of mitigating your risk or it's a sort of insurance system. So bride wealth has always been paid in cattle. So bride wealth is not just a transaction. The groom side of the family and the bride side of the family will come together and often there are multiple rounds of negotiations about how many cows need to be paid, who in the bride family is eligible to receive these cows, Sometimes they even determine the type and the color of the cows that need to be paid. And this is not just the bride's immediate family. So it's not just her father's or her brother's or in her immediate family that are eligible to receive these cows. This could include vast kinship networks that traverse maybe subclans or other adjacent counties. But once this negotiation process is finished, the groom will, the groom will then gather all of his relatives, sometimes a close friend, and these people then contribute the cows towards the marriage. This entire process of giving and receiving cows means that these families are now connected as kin and that obligation to support one another in times of crisis comes back into play. The other type of connection I wanted to talk about was those around livelihoods. Um, some of you I noticed in the poll mentioned types of social connections as ag cooperatives. And so that this is an important one because in South Sudan, people that share similar livelihood activities will come together as a group. So this could include cattle herders, fisher folk, traders, and so on and so forth. But members come together as a group. They elect their own leaders. They have informal rules that, uh, that oblige sharing and support among members. And the leader is the person who will enforce these regulations or uh, penalize someone who refuses to share. But livelihood groups is also interesting because they share resources in two different ways. One is at the group level, they share resources like economic inputs as well as advice. So if I as a cattle herder have lost my cows or my cattle, either through cattle raiding or death or disease, other members in my group will contribute a few cows from their own herd and they will help me to restart my herd. But besides this, if I, as a member, my family it has, uh, doesn't have enough food, maybe some of the crops I planted failed, uh, the members in my group will come together and provide resources. It could be a lactating cow, it could be cash or other types of resources to help me get, uh, get through this crisis. The reason livelihood groups are also important for us to consider is because these are entirely self-formed and there's absolutely no aid intervention. It's not aid actors who are mobilizing these groups. These are self-formed groups. These have always existed in South Sudan and continue to do so. So for aid actors, particularly those of you who are getting involved in economic recovery type of program, it's important to consider how we might work through these existing groups so that we can actually be more effective in our interventions. So rather than selecting a few different individuals from the community, they may all belong to the same group. Working through these groups means you are more effectively distributing those aid resources, but also within these groups, these resources may be shared or they might be given to someone who is deemed particularly vulnerable. So you are doing less harm in that case. And you're also making sure that these groups continue to maintain their cohesion and their sharing and support. So it's important to think about this. As Alex noted, you know, doing this research in a context of an ongoing crisis means we're able to see what existed before aid actors arrived, as well as during this crisis, how have these connections changed? And they have changed in that 
the nature of these connections, the types of support they're able to offer one another, particularly in a protracted crisis, has changed. I want to talk about just two main types of changes. The first one is around sharing aid. And as I noted earlier, food plays, food and cattle both play an important role in the life of the South Sudanese. So in the context of this crisis, many people, you know, their, their own assets are depleted. They're not able to farm. They're not able to produce enough food. So they don't have any, um, too many of their own resources to be able to share. So a lot of people told us that they share food aid that they receive with a wider um, cross-section of their community or people who are their kin as a way of maintaining these important reciprocal support systems. And what that tells us is, one is how important these connections are that even in a crisis where resources are, people's own resources are short, they will share food aid, precious food aid with other people to maintain those connections, but also as aid actors we have now become somewhat intrinsically involved in these underlying social connections just by the fact that this aid is being shared. The second one I want to talk about is how the South Sudanese communities in our research sites have been moving, have moved from, from a cattle-based or cattle or kinship economy more towards cash. And let me explain. Earlier I was talking about how cattle is an important way uh, that's paid as bride wealth and is, is used as a strategy to diversify one's connections. But in the context of this crisis, a lot of people have displaced, they may have lost their herd, and people also fear being uh, becoming targets if they have a lot of cattle. So people might be are disposing of their livestock, but also, um, you know, even within uh, weddings, even occasions like marriage, people prefer that the bride wealth is now paid in cash as opposed to cattle because cash offers a certain level of protection in that sense. But the fact that cash can be concealed is also having negative implications for these connections or these underlying uh, sharing systems. So people said now, you know, cash is, you know, because cash is not visible, one could go to a relative before and because of the fact that cattle was visible, they could they knew that this person was wealthier and could provide them with support. But now, because uh, kin tend to conceal the cash in, 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 in the context of this crisis, a lot of people are not able to access those types of support because they're not able to approach them. So in this context, cash is having a negative impact on people's underlying connections. And I have to admit that uh, for me, learning this was, you know, I, I kind of choked on when I, when I found out about this because I'm a huge cash proponent, right? So for me, finding out that cash actually might have has a negative impact in this context was quite difficult to swallow. So I'm going to go drink some water to relieve my uh, throat choking, but I'm going to hand you over to Alex uh, to talk through uh, uh, some of the other sections. Thanks, Alex. All right. Uh, thank you, Vai. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, the presentation, we like to use the term social connectedness um, rather than social capital. And one of the reasons for that relates to the, the next key message that we, that we have for you today. And that is that social connectedness is not an inherently positive uh, phenomenon. Uh, so to the extent that social connectedness or uh, more, more likely social capital is considered um, in program design these days, it's usually considered in pretty simplistic terms, um, which tend to lack um, nuance or contextual considerations. And it's often um, assumed to just be an inherently desirable outcome. Um, but that's not always the case. Uh, so I'd like to take a moment now just to mention a few of the kind of darker sides of, of social connectedness that, that emerged from our research. So. Uh, the first one that, that I want to mention is that when it comes to social connectedness, it's not always simply a matter of the more, the better. Um, and that's because extensive kinship networks, um, like the ones that Vi was describing, meaning um, networks of family, whether related by blood or by marriage, um, tend to be accompanied by really strong sharing obligations. Um, and so meaning, you know, if you have a lot of relatives, you're, you're expected to share with them. And while that sharing is reciprocal, meaning that those relatives will share in return, um, that, sh that reciprocity is not one-to-one, um, -one, um, meaning um, 
it's very um, common for some households to share more than they receive in return. Um, so situations arise where some households are expected because of the extent of their kinship network to share a lot. Um, they're obliged to share a lot. Um, and if they fail to share a lot, they risk being marginalized or excluded from their community. Um, but they're not getting the same amount in return. Um, so in that sense, um, uh, in some ways, uh, extensive kinship networks can actually be a source of vulnerability for some households. Um, another kind of dark side of social connectedness relates to the fact that some households might find it easier um, than others, or some might find it more difficult than others, is probably a better way of saying it, um, to build or diversify their social connections. Um, and as a result, those households that find it more difficult uh, might struggle to access some forms of support. So this, this can be a result of either active or purposeful exclusion, or maybe um, more um, kind of passive exclusion that happens in the background as a result of gender norms or cultural or social norms. Um, so one example of this kind of exclusion, um, again, relates to marriage. Um, some households uh, may not have the necessary cash or cattle um, to marry. Um, and like Vi said, marriage is a really important way of expanding or maintaining your social network during a crisis. Um, so if you don't have the necessary assets to, to marry, um, you, you may not be able to access these support networks. And this is especially uh, true during crisis when household assets often are depleted. Um, another example of possible exclusion relates to gender. Um, we know, including from lots of other research, that women tend to um, have difficult times establishing relationships of trust with marketplace actors or traders. And those traders, of course, are really important sources of small loans or uh, livelihood inputs during a crisis. Um, and thirdly, and this is especially pronounced in South Sudan, um, political allegiances um, in many cases have divided communities um, and even destroyed kinship networks. Um, and, and this has led in many cases to the intentional marginalization or exclusion of certain households um, within communities. Um, so for example, in Paninjar County, uh, which I mentioned earlier is an opposition controlled area, Many respondents explain that if somebody has relatives who sided with the government during the, the war for whatever reason, um, their household will be excluded from social networks um, and, and, and the community will re refuse to share with them. Um, and, and then finally, just to mention, some households um, often employ kind of uh, harmful strategies to expand their, their networks, social networks, during, especially during times of crisis. Um, so, for example, child marriage or for, forced marriage uh, may be uh, practiced as a means of expanding a, a network um, and accessing bride wealth um, and things like that. So, so these are these are just a few examples which I'm telling you to to try to challenge the the dominant assumption that social connectedness is always a positive outcome. Um, sometimes social connectedness can have a darker side to it. Um, and at the end of this presentation, we're gonna briefly mention some of the implications that these considerations uh, might have for the ways that aid actors design and implement in interventions. But for now, I just want to kind of flag this because we want to start to get beyond this rather simplistic um, way of understanding uh, what, what others call social capital or what we call social connectedness. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over to Gian, though. Um, and Jian's going to provide more details about the quantitative aspects of our research. And she's going to give you some pointers about how you might begin to think about measuring um, social connectedness in the context of your own programming. So Jian. I think Tian said that she is having a little bit of trouble connecting with the audience, so we are going to give her just one minute to um, try to reconnect if everybody doesn't mind sitting tight for a moment. And if not, then uh, we'll have Alex or Vi continue. So just give us one moment. Um, I managed to call back in. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, sorry about that little blip. Um, so. Just carrying on from where Alex and Bai left off, and as they have discussed qualitatively, we found that in South Sudan, and in particular in our research context, that social connectedness or connections are indeed critical, and that they change during crisis 
and that, as Alex has noted, they may not be inherently positive. We were taking this, we were interested in taking this qual uh, qualitative information and then quantitatively examining these dynamics, and in particular, measuring household social connectedness and their linkages to um, resilience. Conceptually, previous efforts to measure social connections, or more frequently, as the terms have been thrown around, social capital or even social cohesion, focused on quantity and quality of social connections, shared values, norms, and understanding. Um, and then the norms that are underpinning these social connections, and then the resources mobilized through reciprocity, cooperation, and collective action. In the resilience space, as some of you may be familiar, much of the focus has been on the bonding, bridging, or the linking social capital, and on the economic resources mobilized through such relationships, uh, which reflect um, some of the findings that Alex and Bai have shared in these previous slides. Um, these dynamics or concepts were measured often through household surveys, and though to a lesser extent, through qualitative efforts such as interviews, focus groups, and in the political science discipline, often through behavioral games. Yet the challenges remain in terms of how such efforts are contextualized to really truly reflect people's lived experiences and the nuances and dynamics that Vi and Alex noted in the social connections and especially in terms of how they relate to resilience. So with that background in mind and honoring our intentional efforts to cast a bit of a more of a holistic effort to examine social connections, we set about um, developing a culturally contextualized household survey. So we depended really heavily in this effort to reflect the lived experiences of men and women who spoke to us in interviews and focus groups, um, as well as formative research by um, speaking with context experts and relying heavily on the rich literature that currently exists um, that uh, explore the critical and complex social connections in South Sudan to develop, translate, and appeal to their survey. Through that effort, we identified six dimensions of social connectedness and operationalize resilience in our context in three ways, as you see this on the slide here. Um, first, looking in terms of resilience, adaptive livelihood strategy, if and how households are able to adapt their livelihood strategy, their household food security status, and as well as the self-reported resilience, one measure of uh, resilience um, that's building off the work of Jones and Tanner from ODI, for those of you who may be familiar. Um, Looking at the six dimensions that are on the slide right now on social connectedness, uh, we identified six that really resonated with um, the people we spoke to and the formative research. The first is the number of social linkages. The number of um, people respondents noted that households could turn to or be called upon during a time of need. The second is the diversity of social linkages, the different types of social linkages that a respondent noted that he or she can call upon or be called upon um, during time of need. And here our dimensions really reflected the, different, the variety of different groups that people can turn to, including relatives, ethnic groups, livelihood groups, NGOs, etc. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail in subsequent slides. Third dimension is the reliability of social linkages. Um, the respondent's confidence in his or her ability to rely on social linkages and mobilize resources in time of need. And resources, when I note that, I mean both material and non. Uh, the fourth is reciprocity, their respondent's confidence in his or her ability to rely on social linkages, identify to mobilize resources in time of need. And then fifth um, is the ability to mobilize resources. Um, and then the last, which is critical, is the dynamics of how these dimensions change over time. And those of you who are familiar with the social capital measurements uh, will also see that these six dimensions build upon existing efforts and um, are embedded within that are the bonding, bridging, and linking um, social capital that you often see in previous efforts. Recognizing that both social connectedness and resilience are dynamic and in turn their linkages, uh, we wanted to capture changes over time. So in our quantitative effort, we are conducting a panel survey that is following up with the same household over multiple time points. So earlier this year, in the springtime, we surveyed a total of 933 respondents in the three research sites. And in November, about six months from the first round, we plan to track the same households to repeat the survey with them, um, essentially doubling our sample size. And this is important so that it allows us to assess change over time within the same household. 
In the next few slides, we're going to share some preliminary um, descriptive summaries, um, but please note that they are preliminary and we're not drawing any associations just yet. Um, as I'm going through the graphics, Alex will jump in here and there um, to provide some nuance to these descriptive findings and to draw from our qualitative insights. First, in terms of network size, which is the one, the first dimension of social connectedness that I mentioned, uh, many respondents noted that their network size decreased, see the bar in gray, since their displacement. However, many others also reported that it has either stayed the same or even increased in a few cases. Um, while this graphic kind of plays up the assumption that in crisis and development, um, that social connections or the number of people you can turn to um, decreases in, in such difficult times, um, it is important to keep in mind that the nuances that may be hidden in certain, quality, um, sorry, in certain quantitative um, graphics. So I'm going to just turn to Alex here to add a little bit more nuance to what we're seeing here graphically. Yeah, thanks. So, so like Jian says, it's pretty clear in this um, chart that, that we see that generally over the course of displacement, the size of people's social networks seems to shrink. Um, and that might be true. Uh, but it's also really important to note that households do take very proactive measures and strategic measures to try to rebuild their social networks or to reestablish their social connections. Um, and, and, and this is really just a testament to the, the, the perceived importance of these, these networks um, to, to these individuals. Um, so in Peninja, for example, um, which is an area home to many IDPs, like I mentioned before, uh, we heard that many new arrivals in the community would often take specific steps to try to grow social connections with members of the host community. Um, for example, they'd often share non-food items, NFIs, um, which uh, IDPs tend to, to, to receive more often than, than host, host communities would. So it was kind of a desirable and very strategically um, chosen commodity to be shared. Um, and interestingly, hosts um, also explain that they tend to share resources with IDPs, um, and they do that also for strategic reasons. They do that to try to expand the geographic scope of their support networks. And that's because they, they know that eventually the IDPs are likely to return to their communities of origin, and when they do, um, the host communities will, as a result of having shared with them and grown these social connections, have a broader um, geographical social network, basically. Um, so, you know, just to, just to flag that while, while this chart shows that networks tend to decrease in size as a result of displacement, that's not um, to say that IDPs are idly standing by or, uh, you know, just letting this happen. It's not a desirable outcome. It's something that, um, that people tend to try to mitigate um, using pretty strategic and savvy uh, measures. So back to Jim. Thanks, Alex. Um, turning next to diversity dimension, the second dimension that we identify through our formative research, um, we find that while households still report that they turn most to their kin, that is, relatives by blood, relation, or by marriage in times of need, we are finding their diverse sources of social connections or um, people that uh, households turn to in time of need. Um, this is especially stark within the POC where many report uh, relying on um, connections beyond their kinship. Um, that is here, which kind of plays up the, um, the finding that by share qualitatively, where households are relying heavily on livelihood group associations um, and community groups. Um, Alex will jump in now to share a little bit more about the shifting nature of the social connections, um, especially in the Bantu POC. Um, I actually don't have too much to say on this one, but um, in, in the POC we, we do hear that, that livelihood, informal livelihood associations are um, extremely important sources of uh, resilience for, for households. Um, and these um, livelihood associations, um, as Vi mentioned before, it's really important to note, are, are organic or they're self-forming. Um, these are not the functions of aid interventions. And we'll talk a little bit more about, um, about the implications that that has later. Um, but, but as Gian mentioned, these groups and other sources of um, kind of support and social networks from non-kin are especially important in the POC as a result of kinship networks being broken down, eroding um, as a result of displacement. Households are separated um, during flight, 
or perhaps they're, um, you know, they lose track of their relatives for other reasons. Um, but yes, in the POC, diverse sources of social connectedness that often do not involve kin um, are really important. Thanks, Alex. And that built, um, that lends itself really nicely to this next slide, which is looking at uh, one of the indicators under the third dimension of reliability. We find that in Mercona and Panajar, the two other research sites, majority of the respondents um, are somewhat or very confident about their ability to get help outside the area. However, in the Ben to POC, uh, more people are more people are less confident. If that makes sense, and this also plays out qualitatively, as Alex just noted where many respondents in the POC shared that with displacement, many were disconnected from people, and over time, as years passed, um, they were unable to reach out for support. And one quote that comes to mind and resonates this point really well is um, a respondent who shared, quote, if they don't hear from you, they forget about you. Shifting gears a little bit and looking at um, one resilience um, indicator, um, while we've yet to assess the association between social connectedness and food security, we flagged that despite the strategic connections that we've seen in the previous slides, the majority of the households are reporting moderate to severe levels of food insecurity. We are not suggesting here, and I really want to emphasize that, that social connections are linked to food insecurity. However, it does, um, this slide does flag the potential negative implications that social connections may have where norms and obligatory sharing of resources maybe to household detriment. Um, we're looking forward to kind of unpacking these dynamics a little bit and look forward to sharing these, um, these dynamics and findings with you, but just want to flag that as it does quantitatively uh, flesh out the potential negative ramifications um, that Alex and Bai have both mentioned. Um, shifting gears to another um, measure of resilience, um, which is the three uh, subjective resilience measures that I mentioned earlier, um, which is from the Jones and Tanner work from ODI. On the other hand, it paints a quite a different picture. Across the three subjective resilience questions where households are asked the extent to which they agree or disagree to statements about their capacity to respond and or bounce back from future shocks, majority of the households are agreeing or strongly agreeing to um, the fact that they can bounce back from challenges, that they can change primary income or livelihood source, or, or that they can get by during more frequent and intense threats across the three sites. These three indicators relate to the broader discussion in the resilience sphere of the growing interest in capturing households' own understanding of their resilience, holistically taking into account all of their conditions and characteristics and vulnerabilities and reporting back, rather than the questions themselves imposing what resilience they mean to households. Um, it also showcases, um, in conjunction with the food security uh, potential perplexing results, the overall challenges of being able to, accurate, to capture and make sense of the multifaceted measures of the tangible and more subjective measures of resilience. Once we have the second round of data, we plan to assess the linkages between social connections and our three operationalization of resilience. So, um, we look forward to sharing those results with you once they are more fleshed out after the second round. So in conclusion, wrapping up the quant um, section, our efforts to develop a household survey involved multiple and iterative formative steps to ensure that household survey was contextually, um, was culturally contextualized. That being said, however, for those of you who are unable to engage in such intensive preparatory stages, um, there are some, still some lessons to be learned from our effort. So first is the importance of reflecting and honoring the local context, the lived experiences of men and women in a research site. Um, second is being informed by the insights and relying heavily on the local insights of the local team members. And third is not reinventing the wheel. Um, there is extensive literature, and that certainly was the case in South Sudan, and likely in the context that you're operating in, and your efforts to unpack these dynamics would benefit much from the existing knowledge and the expertise of your local staff members and the context experts. All of this being said, however, is the need to be really self-critical and reflective in your effort to really unpack and develop these household surveys. Um, be keen to pick up on dynamics of exclusion, marginalization, and existing power dynamics that exist uh, within the literature 
um, as well that may be playing out in the uh, experts that you're relying on as well as your local, um, local staff members. So avoid perpetuating or worsening um, the social local support system that you're trying to unpack. With, with that background in mind, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Vi and Alex to um, draw some implications of our findings for other contexts. Oh, um, that will be me, Alex. So thanks, Gian. So just trying to come back to this takeaway, a lot of you in the poll said that you're looking for applications in your context. For example, someone said they're in Haiti. Some of you are going to South Sudan. So what we wanted to do was we're still going to use some of the learning and the examples from South Sudan, but we're going to try and broaden out the applicability of these in your own context, right? So I'm going to take a crack at um, uh, the first few, and then Alex will do um, the others. Let's think about targeting. So as humanitarian aid actors, when you go into a crisis context, we spend a lot of time developing these individual or household level criteria to identify who are the most vulnerable, who is eligible to receive food or cash, and so on and so forth. But if we're finding that once we provide people with this aid, they're going to turn around and share it with other people in their community, and that's their strategy for maintaining those social connections, which is so important for that longer term recovery, then we might want to think about how do we rethink targeting? Do we need to spend all of this time um, developing individual criteria, or do we want to have more transparent discussions with the community to be able to provide aid? But related to that example and thinking about impact and sustainability, we always think of humanitarian aid, whether it's food or cash, as a sort of short-term uh, relief, right? But if we know that people do share their aid with other connections to maintain that longer term recovery or resilience factors, then how does it help us to make a stronger case for humanitarian aid, intervening in or you know, supporting these longer term recovery or resilience measures, but also how does it help us to think about what evidence we need to gather? We might be thinking about we provide food aid. Let's think about let's uh, let's try to capture how have people's uh, food coping strategies or household nutrition increased. But we may not be seeing those results because that food is being shared. But the fact that, that food is being shared towards this longer term recovery and resilience means we need to be able to then rethink that and think about how are we as humanitarian aid actors having a longer term impact and sustainability in the communities where we intervene. Um, and I'm going to hand uh, back to Alex to talk through the returns and the do no harm. Thanks, Vi. Uh, so just kind of one other um, potential context uh, that so a social connectedness lens may be uh, really helpful for is, is when aid actors want to think about how to facilitate or help facilitate dignified and, and of course, voluntary returns. Um, so during displacement, uh, we know that it's very common for social networks to be disrupted or, or even destroyed. And this can happen um, when people are separated from one another during flight, uh, or perhaps they're uh, purposely, uh, act, they, maybe they purposely intentionally cut off communication um, with friends and relatives back home to avoid harm. Uh, you know, there's, you can imagine a situation perhaps when a, a, uh, a, an IDP is um, is uh, seeking uh, shelter in a, in a government-controlled area, but his family is back in an opposition-controlled area, um, that sort of communication could potentially bring, bring harm. So for a number of reasons, um, that is to say that you know, social networks tend to, as, as, we, as we showed before, uh, break down to some extent um, in context of displacement. Um, and in South Sudan, at least, we know that um, one of the main barriers that IDPs face to returning is, is a lack of kind of trustworthy information about safety and security back home. And um, one of the reasons for that is that um, these social networks have, have uh, eroded and communication is, is, is no longer possible. And so understanding a little bit more about how displaced communities um, are socially connected um, to people back home or not um, 
maybe a really helpful entry point to start thinking about taking concrete steps to help IDPs make informed um, and voluntary decisions around um, returns. Uh, so, you know, there's a number of concrete ways that you can think about doing this. Uh, one is as simple potentially as distributing cell phones or airtime to help people reestablish these connections. Or maybe something a little bit more nuanced around, you know, partnering up with, with family tracing initiatives, um, et cetera. Um, and then finally, just to kind of round us out here, um, the last kind of potential application for uh, adopting a social connectedness lens in programming is just that it can help aid actors um, better ensure that they, they do no harm. Um, aid actors need to be really proactive in seeking to understand local power dynamics um, and identifying potential reasons for social exclusion or, or marginalization. And this social connectedness approach is, is a pretty, we think, innovative and, and helpful way of going about that. Um, and, and critically, we need to make sure that our own program activities are not inadvertently undermining the way that, that people establish connections with one another um, or the support that they provide to each other. Uh, and, and as Vi mentioned before, this may be especially important uh, when, when doing cash programming. Um, cash can, it seems, play a particularly disruptive role in terms of social connectedness. So we need to, we need to think critically, especially in the context of cash programming. So um, a key takeaway from this research is, is really just the importance of being hyper-reflective and self-reflective about the ways in which our programming is interacting both positively and negatively, uh, potentially negatively, with these local dynamics around around social connections and, and support systems. So just to kind of summarize again here, um, we talked about the fact that social connections are, are really important during crises as sources of economic and social well-being. I hope we've convinced you of that uh, by now. If not, uh, please do tell us why. Um, the second thing is that uh, we know that in protracted or extended crises, um, social connected connections change. These are dynamic systems. Um, and, and the third thing is that social connection, connectedness is not always a positive outcome. Um, we need to be nuanced and critical and acknowledge some of the, the darker sides of social connectedness. And then as Gian said, uh, when we go about trying to measure social connectedness, both qualitatively but probably especially quantitatively, we need to be really, really careful to capture and honor the, 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 the local context and, and, and the insights of the community. So um, those are the key takeaways we hope to leave you with today. Um, before we go over to Q&A, I wanted to take a second to acknowledge specifically our South Sudanese uh, research staff, um, our field team, uh, who have just been incredible assets to, 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 to us. As, as we're called in South Sudan, Kawaja's outsiders, um, they've been incredibly patient uh, in explaining uh, these dynamics to us. We're grateful. Uh, it's been as um, uh, it's just been a, a, a joy to, to work with them. So um, with that, I think we'll turn it over to the Q and A's. I'll leave this key takeaway slide up um, for now. So I'll turn it over to Laura. I think to to bring on your questions. Yes, um, thank you so much, Alex and Gian and Vi, for those presentations. Um, we have some questions for um, all of you, actually. Um, I will get started. I think first there are a couple of questions, particularly about the South Sudan experience, and then there are some more um, broader questions. Um, but let's start, I think, with the South Sudan experience. Um, there was one question, was religious affiliation a relevant variable or category of social connectedness? Um, another question, particularly about the South Sudan case, is um, were there any lessons from the differences in results by location? For example, Rukona Payam not having much of a decline in social connectedness or bent you having a higher proportion of persons of concern, um, any of those sort of contextual differences between the three locations. Um, I will pause there and then we'll do another round of questions. Um, this can be open to uh, any of you who wish to respond, Alex or Vi or Gian. John, do you want to take the one around um, religious affiliations being a variable? I can certainly answer that, but I thought that might be something that you could answer in our quant data collection. Sure. Um, Alex probably better poised to answer this, giving us field insights, but we did include religious 
uh, we chose not to include uh, religion affiliation as part of our um, quantitative efforts, given the qualitative formative research, which indicated that for the most part, uh, given the homogeneity within the sample, meaning that uh, our sample and people who were included uh, were largely from new air, um, ethnic group and linked uh, religious background. So Alice, did you want to build on that? Yeah, sure. So, so like Gian said, um, there's not a lot of variation in terms of religious affiliation within our sample. So that's why we didn't um, include it in the, in the quantitative um, measurement. That is not to say, however, that um, religion is not necessarily an important source of social connectedness or support for our respondents. It's just that because it's, um, it's homogenous across the sample, it wouldn't um, necessarily be a helpful indicator for us on the quantitative side. But I can speak a little bit more to the, um, the, the, the dynamics around religion and social connectedness, for sure. So um, we hear oftentimes when, when, um, when we're asked why do people um, support each other, uh, why, why are they so willing to, to provide this support? Uh, which is often described in kind of altruistic terms. Um, it, it is often explained in, in religious terms. Um, and uh, so, so there's obviously um, kind of a religious tradition that is underpinning aspects of this sharing, but I don't want to overemphasize that, that um, component of this. There are, as Vi has carefully explained, a lot of other reasons that people support each other around norms and obligations um, and, and, and um, and other local dynamics, but certainly religion is, is an important um, piece of this puzzle. Um, so I hope that answers part of your question. Um, I'm trying to remember what the other question was. Sorry. Uh, so the second question um, I think was about there was one about yeah. Sorry, Laura, go ahead. Please. Uh, sure, it was just about if there were sort of differences in results by location based on some of the contextual factors, like um, Rubcona not having as much of a decline in social connections, um, or Bentu having more people of concern, um, or other differences between those three locations, if there are lessons that Mercy Corps pulled out from that or could draw. Perhaps not if it was not a large sample size. Gian, did you want to take that from the, I think this is a reference to the quant slides. Um, sure. I, I'm a little hesitant to draw too many conclusions given the fact that the data analysis is still preliminary. Um, but one thing that we did not mention and go into greater detail is that our sampling was actually conducted by displacement status across the different research sites um, in order to capture the different resident status um, and the potential different ways in which displacement status may be impacting um, or affecting social connectedness. So I'm going to hold that and just whet your appetite uh, for the second round. Um, but we do, the hypothesis was that they, we did it and state that there may be differences in social connectedness. But I think Alice or Vi, I think qualitatively you guys also saw differences um, across different sites. Any insights you want to share um, from the qualitative side? So I can just say, I think one thing, sorry, um, and we might have you know, forgotten to mention this in the abbreviations, is that POC stands for the Protection of Civilian Sites, and apologize if it, uh, that came across as people of concern, the humanitarian sector, we have multiple abbreviations. But just wanted to say, I think Alex might have briefly noted this, um, the number of social connections, the decrease in the POC, again, not wanting to make any conclusive remarks there. People who are within these displacement sites, so this is a really large campsite kind of thing where people have considerable mobility restrictions, right? Um, a lot of people said that they had either lost uh, communication with their relatives or kin in other locations. Uh, it's a cell phone access issue, network issue, which is quite common in South Sudan. But the other thing is also, I think Alex briefly mentioned the sort of role of political allegiances, because a larger political crisis means people have willfully severed their connections with, uh, with their relatives who may be living in government-controlled areas, or even within opposition-held areas, some factions are breaking off and joining the government. So people are willfully severing these connections because they fear being uh, perceived as government loyalists, particularly in a camp that's all full of newer people that have fled due to the crisis. So they're unable to access 
their kinship networks outside. So they're now, their connections are now all within the campsite. They have formed new connections with these people from other counties, but it has now limited their connections, their kinship connections with people outside the POC because of this displacement. Again, coming back to what Gian said, we are trying to understand what effect this displacement has had on people's ability to draw on these kinship networks. And this is an important um, point I just wanted to note there. I don't, uh, Alex or Gian, is there anything to add? Otherwise, I think um, we can try to take some other questions. Sure. Um, OK, so let's move on. Uh, there are quite a lot of questions and comments around um, implications for programming. Um, so let's take, firstly, let's talk about targeting. Um, so there's a question from Jen Denemy about um, how do we take into account the fact that people will redistribute assets on their own, um, but we still do and probably should uh, target people by vulnerability. So what sorts of considerations might we want to do? Um, any sort of practical real-world tips. Um, and then I had sort of a related question, which is um, particular to cash programming, by which you brought up, um, is uh, that you were finding here that cash can, in some respects, maybe make you more vulnerable because it's something then that you'll have to share fairly widely, um, or that can make you be seen as more wealthy. Um, and in other research, it's been found, for example, that food assistance is shared more widely than cash, which tends to be held more closely at the household level. Um, so you know, is this something that might be specific to South Sudan? Is this something that we should think about more from a targeting perspective or maybe a modality selection perspective? Um, I'll pause there. Uh, maybe buy for the cash. And then um, Dion, maybe if you wanted to talk about um, the issue of targeting and sharing, uh, or they're, they're sort of intertwined. Um, and then after that round, we've got more questions on uh, applications for programming. I can go. Let me start with the cash question and see if I can also answer the targeting question, John. I'll give you a bit of a break. So just want to say that um, when I was talking about cash, um, I did want to caveat this to say that there is a larger move towards a cash-based economy in South Sudan because of the crisis. But, so I'm not specifically talking about cash aid, but cash aid is unfortunately a part of that system, particularly if you think about uh, very rural economies where humanitarian actors might be injecting cash. We are a part of that system. We're fueling that transition. And as, a, as an indirect result, any negative consequences that go with it. So that's an important one to remember. Uh, what I did want to say is that I don't know if this can be generalized to other contexts outside of South Sudan, particularly as we know from our work on multiple cash studies that cash is an important and effective modality of, and people want cash, right? So I will, I will keep my answers to what we know within the South Sudan context. And this is why it's interesting because in South Sudan, cash doesn't have the same effect as it does in other economies. In this case, because it's very much a barter-based system, people have always relied on cattle or sharing of food. People do need cash in the context of this crisis, so it's not a matter of need. So people do want and they do need cash aid, but they sh they, even if they do share cash, let's consider this. The amount of cash we provide is normally based on uh, people being able to meet a certain number of food needs. But cash can also be used for other types of needs. So if people do need cash and it can mean multiple needs, for example, they may be more reluctant to share. But the other side of this is some respondents said, because I was chosen for cash aid and cash is so much in need in the community, my relatives no longer want to support me because they think I'm more or less self-reliant, right? So that's the other side of it. So we do need to it's not specifically about food or cash or the type of humanitarian aid, but if we're finding out that people are sharing or there are obligations to share, Vai, still there? We lost you for a moment. Hello, Vi. Okay, uh, Vi, we're not hearing at the moment. Um, I wonder, Alex or Gian, if you 
had more to say about that particular question, and otherwise we can um, put a hold on it and come back to Vi when she's able to rejoin us. Um, and I don't know if either of you maybe had a question, um, or sorry, had a comment to respond to, um, sort of question about targeting, about how do we um, address the fact that we know people are going to share, but we still wish to target the most vulnerable. Um, Dion, perhaps, could you take that? Um, I, I think beyond what Vi was saying, that I think I'll hold off until she comes back online. Could we shift to the next question? Sure, that'd be fine. Um, so let's talk a little bit about other program implications. Um, there were a couple of suggestions. Um, one is from Diane Russell, and that was to perhaps program teams can hire a local anthropologist or sociologist uh, sort of to have on the team or to be a consultant during program design and program implementation to make sure that this local context as far as social connectivity is taken into consideration. Um, there was another suggestion or perspective from Kristen O'Planick, which is that maybe when we see the most vulnerable having to share some of the resources that they get in humanitarian assistance, maybe that can be viewed in some regards still as a positive outcome, because that's a way that they are building social connections or maintaining connections, and that that's something that they might be able to use um, in the future to rely upon. Um, I would just note myself to editorialize a little bit, but that is somewhat backed up by some other research. For example, uh, there's some research from Sarah Bailey and DRC on cash and voucher assistance a few years back that um, observed that sometimes people would use a little bit of their assistance, say, to contribute to someone's funeral expenses or to buy a friend a coffee or a meal, and they saw this as a way to um, repay the assistance that they'd been given and to sort of re-maintain that connection in the future. Um, so just two perspectives there. Um, no need to respond unless you wish. Um, additionally, there were a couple of questions. Um, Dick Kinsley had a question about, um, did Mercy Corps as regarding its programming in South Sudan, did you have the flexibility to adjust to these local dynamics as you learned about them, or were you more locked into the donor preferences about what sort of aid and how to provide it? Um, or more generally speaking, could we talk about how could programs have the flexibility to design programming that responds to local social connectivity? Um, and then a second question, maybe. Um, would be sort of how, you know, should we try to engineer or manipulate these social connections and how much should we do it? Um, there was a comment, I think, from Vi about being hyper-reflective about the ways in which our programming does affect social dynamics, um, since it does one way or another, um, positively or negatively. And so, um, you know, are there any tips maybe about how to be observant about this on a day-to-day, real-world basis, and about when might we want to be intentional about helping people create or maintain those social connections. Um, you know, I can think a lot of humanitarian or development interventions do actually do this, right? If we're, say, trying to help create an informal association of traders or of vocational training um, classmates, um, or if say on the nutrition side, we're creating mother-to-mother -mother support groups. This is something that we do as outsiders try to create ourselves, but of course we're having these implications as well. And um, so any reflections or observations from Alex or Gian, and hopefully Vi will be able to rejoin us in a moment. Sure. Um, just taking, well, Diane and I were having a conversation in the chat box, but I will kind of expand on the point there. Um, Absolutely. Um, your point earlier in the chat box and what Laura has iterated is that it is not new that social connections matter, um, that they're important and they're a critical source. Um, I think what is a little bit less done um, is, is being very thoughtful and intentional about how those things come into account or taken into account for designing programs um, and being more explicitly aware that Program activities are complementing and not necessarily undermining those dynamics. So 
your point about having an anthropologist, sociologist, I mean, I would love to do that. Um, but I also know that within the funding constraints and realities of these programs, that often is not allowed. So the, one of the takeaways from this exercise, I hope, um, is that programs and implementers elsewhere reckon, start to recognize that it is important in their day-to-day -day programming to really be thoughtful and take into account the, the ways in which their activities are, are being, um, are affecting or are interacting with local support systems in, in, in a way that does not necessarily have to be as rigorous or in depth as our efforts here, um, but that it is done so intentionally on a continual basis. Um, Alex, did you have anything to add on there until Vi joins us? Um, no, I, I completely agree with that. I did want to just, um, I, there were two kind of similar questions that came at the end um, with regards to, you know, should we, should we think about designing program explicitly to try to respond to or at least reflect social, local social connections and those dynamics? And then there was another question, to what extent should we try to manipulate um, social connectedness um, so, so these are kind of uh, similar questions in the sense that um, what 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 we envisioned was that these social networks can be to some extent leveraged um, for impact, um, uh, you know, by by you know innovative targeting strategies, for example, by recognizing that these informal livelihood group groups exist and targeting through those groups to reach more people, and then allowing those groups to. Um, distribute uh, that assistance on their own terms based on um, kind of local understandings of vulnerability that exist, um, which often are kind of shaped by the degree to which households are socially connected. Um, so to that extent, yeah, let's let's think about programming um, in ways that reflect uh, these local dynamics. But manipulating these these um, these dynamics is needs to be done, if if at all, extremely carefully, given that. Um, you know, for example, these livelihood groups are are completely self self founding, self self forming. Um, they they're not uh, they're not functions of aid interventions. And as a result, um, you know, interacting with them or trying to change the way that they operate um, may may really prove to be destabilizing or destructive. So, despite the fact that you know there are some uh, potentially um, not necessarily uh, uh, appetizing aspects to these groups, such as the fact that they, you know, uh, are dominated by men only in many cases. Um, you know, seeking to 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 change that um, may actually result in um, negative outcomes in the long term. But there are these darker sides to to social connectedness that I discussed that, that aid actors do need to be aware of and can start to think about. Um, uh, you know, programming around uh, and trying to manipulate uh, those darker sides in a sense. Um, so, you know, thinking about targeting in ways that um, ensure that people with extensive kinship and sharing obligations, um, trying to help them out a little bit um, to meet those obligations and re remain socially connected, um, things like that. So, so manipulate, yes, but very carefully and only to try to address some of the, the darker sides of social connectedness. Um, program around and through these these social networks, uh, abs absolutely, um, but carefully. Um, I think there may have been a couple other questions, but is Vi? Uh, did I see? No, I didn't see Vi come back. Okay, um, so I'll leave it there. Sure. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it looks like we may have lost Vi for the rest of it, but we'll see. Um, I'm glad you brought up the dark side of social connectedness. Uh, there were a couple of comments and observations on this. Um, William from CRS certainly said it's good to bring this up because this is sort of an underappreciated area. Um, so good to bring it to the front and center. Um, and Carla Handley also had an observation that thinking about which level of social organization we're looking through and sort of resilience for whom can be important that, for example, having to share might be bad for the household or individual resilience, but might be better at the level of the larger group or the community. Um, and I think it looks like we do have Vi back, but only on the phone. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, I think she's just, uh, Vi, if you press star six, that should unmute you. Hopefully that will work. Um, so we will figure this out. Um, 
I, in the meantime, I think I had one question sort of about the dark side of social connectivity, which is in your research, did you find that people would readily admit this, or is this something that you had to get from key informant interviews? Um, you know, people willing to mention that they're considering marrying off one of their children, or that if they got any assistance that they would have to share a certain percentage of it. Um, is this something that people tend to be forthcoming about, or did you have to use other research methods to try and capture this? Great. So this is a this is this is a, a real struggle that that uh, we often encounter trying to conduct um, kind of pure research as aid actors. Um, many times uh, we're assumed to be doing some form of um, needs assessment uh, or targeting exercise when, of course, we're not. Um, so to to some extent, people are relatively forthcoming with this information. But in order to build those relationships, uh, we rely heavily on our our local. Uh, research team, um, who are members of uh, the communities in which we are conducting research, um, who are aware of these dynamics very well themselves, and who are in a position to build relationships of trust with our research participants. So um, we work that with them carefully to ensure that they are fully aware of kind of re research ethics and informed consent. And then once we've done that, uh, we encourage them to to reassure our participants to share freely remind them that this is not a needs assessment, that the way that they, the information that they provide us is not going to shape the, the, the extent of the assistance that they receive from Mercy Corps or other agencies. And by doing that, we, we, we have found that people are quite forthcoming with us about some of these darker sides of social connectedness, um, especially um, with regards to kind of the political um, aspects of this. Um, I was actually quite surprised by how candid people were about um, uh, intentionally excluding others from their community who were suspected to have even distant political affiliations um, with the government. Not even the immediate household, but distant relatives may be suspected of being sympathetic to the government while they're out. And people were very candid about that. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, it's a process um, that we've put a lot of thought into. And again, we rely on our, our local team, uh, but uh, people tend to be quite forthcoming. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I had a little bit of a question maybe going back to um, the theme on if you're able to be flexible and adaptive to this, um, or if you feel locked into donor requirements, um, which is that obviously Mercy Corps is active in response and resilience as well as recovery programming in South Sudan and elsewhere. Um, how has this work already changed, how you're approaching what you do in South Sudan or elsewhere? and if it hasn't yet, then how might it change in the future? This could be uh, for Kian, perhaps, sure. or else, uh, if you prefer. I can pick that one. Um, and then Vi's back, so I'd love to get her in here again, too. Um, sure. So we are, just to be clear, we're still conducting this research. Um, so we're we're still trying to understand what this what this uh, really means for our programming, and we're we're looking forward to continuing to communicate with many of you who are here today, to um, to understand the the implications that this has for for our programming. We're going to rely very heavily on on that sort of communication to to unpack some of this. But um, we do we have started thinking and, and implementing to some extent um, the the findings from this research in our programming in South Sudan. Um, one way that we did that is uh, we recently conducted a, a market systems assessment in Mundri, which is a different context in South Sudan, uh, where we incorporated kind of qualitative questions um, based on this research um, to investigate kind of aspects of social connectedness um, and to ensure that, that our future interventions in Mundri do no harm. And, and importantly, to kind of identify leverage points um, especially around uh, kind of informal livelihood groups where we may be able to, to increase our impact um, as a result of using some of this social connectedness learning. So, you know, we ask questions around, you know, who do people uh, turn to in, in, in times of need in their own communities, um, you know, and who comes to them, um, and how does this differ based on gender. Um, and also, you know, we, we try to identify specific livelihoods which are conducted in uh, informal groups and think about how a market systems approach may interact with, with those groups um, positively and negatively. Again, it's as much about doing no harm as it is about maximizing impact. Um, 
So, so yeah, through through market assessments, we're we're starting at looking at uh, starting to look at implementing some of some of this learning. Vi may have a bit more to say about this, I suspect, um, and I would like to bring her back now that she's on the phone. Vi. Wonderful, Vi. Are you? Yes, I am back, and I apologize for that was my get out of jail free card. My internet lost connection, but. I was trying to make a point. I apologize. I'm going to pick up. Um, sorry, Alice. I think you covered the market system question that you were talking about. I do want to, in the interest of time, just go back a little bit to that targeting question. And as I was saying earlier, food aid, for example, before the biometric system, people may have been receiving more than they might have deserved, but they were, that also meant that they were able to share and maintain those crucial reciprocity systems, right, that, they're, that are so important to them. But now with the biometric system, a lot of people say we receive just that, just enough for our own household, so we're not able to share. So in that sense, while the biometric system is important for us to be able to provide value for money and be more effective, it also has then, in this case, harmed those, you know, the, the ability of people to share and uh, therein those reciprocal support systems that they rely on. So the same is true for cash. As we think about humanitarian aid, it's really about saying if people are sharing this, what and those those sharing systems are important for longer term recovery, how can we rethink the amount of money we give people or the amount of food that we provide people to continue that share crucial sharing system? The other question you had was around vulnerability and targeting. Yes, as aid actors, we do, you know, we do go through these motions, but if we know that the, the, con the definition of vulnerability in the context of Kaltaran, for example, can be quite different. Uh, Alex was talking earlier about these um, sharing obligations. So as a man, for example, I might have now, I might now be required to support far more households because some of my male relatives have died. As a woman, I might have fewer people that can support me or I might have fewer kinship connections that I can turn to for support. So vulnerability in the context of in the context of the countries we operate can be quite different. We might be thinking about it very much around, you know, how much do how much how many assets do people have, how much do they earn, um, you know, do they need support, but the vulnerability in this context can look quite different. So Working through community structures, and not just community leaders, because there could be some elite capture there, but bringing that out to the rest of the community to understand what is this context can actually help you be more efficient and effective in how you think about vulnerability and who you target as part of this aid. Um, that's all I'm going to say, and I, I apologize if I, if, I, if I dropped off partway through my um, rant earlier, but I hope I have answered some of your questions, and of course, uh, we're still available post if you'd like to send us an email or set up a Skype chat to talk through other things. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Holly, and uh, not at all, we're glad that you were able to come and join us again. Um, looking at the time, it is just about 11 o'clock here on the East Coast, so we are going to wrap up. Um, I would like to say a huge thank you to Vi and Gian and Alex for presenting and for sharing all of your experiences and insights. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the participants, especially those of you who posted questions. Um, I know we did not have time to get to everybody, but I'm glad that we were able to have such an engaging and fruitful discussion. Um, and as always, a huge thank you to Charlene and Shira and Dawit and everybody on the MarketLink side who actually make this happen. Um, have a wonderful rest of your morning or rest of your evening, depending on where you are. Uh, please don't forget to fill in the poll questions, um, share your feedback. And as we said, um, the web links to a lot of these reports are over on the left. Um, and there's going to be a transcript and a recording of the slides up fairly shortly. Uh, Shailen, I'll turn it over to you for any last wrap-up. But thank you so much, everybody.